How's it going, everybody? It's Pilot Flame, and we are back with another deadline, not the deadline, deadline ish, kind of the deadline stream for game week three. We have recorded this the night before. I uh, did the stream over on Twitch. So if you are joining us here on YouTube, I will probably be in the chat as answering any questions. I uh, might be asking questions, but hopefully answering questions that you may have before the game week three deadline we have a lot to cover uh this week uh title of the stream is singing the blues we're gonna be talking a bit about chelsea comparing some player heat maps because we definitely want to get involved in that as they have a great run of fixtures coming up starting in game week three we're also going to take a look at some of the injuries uh, that have happened over the past few days, which could cause some players to see more time, some players that are currently in our team to be removed, uh, and everything basically in between. Uh, also, you will see that I'm much more streamlined. Cut my hair yesterday, cut my beard, cut it all off. Uh, it's too hot for it. Um, so we're going to be much more, much more streamlined, hopefully more concise, hopefully more informative as well at the same time. Uh, but without further ado, let's get into it. So we got our team up on the screen for you there. Like I said, if you're following along over on YouTube uh, at the time of recording, uh, this, this stream will probably run 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and I'll try to let it cut it short about 15 minutes before the deadline. But make sure if you have any questions, answer them in the chat. If I'm not answering them on the actual uh, screen itself, it's because it's a VOD over on YouTube. Uh, it's in the title. Um, so make sure to uh, check the chat. And I will try to answer as much as I can. Uh, so without further ado, let's take a look at how the team currently sets up. Uh, let's start off with uh, the goalkeepers. Well, we got uh, Johnston uh, versus Turner this week. Um, I'm pretty sure Johnston is probably going to be the better goalkeeper this week. I believe Man United will probably score at home. At least it would seem likely. Brentford will probably score at home too. Um, but uh, I think that uh, Johnston is probably the better pick here, uh, all things considered. Although, with a certain injury, that might make it a little bit more difficult for United to score. But we'll come on to that in a bit. Uh, we got Ben Chilwell. We got William Saliba. We got S. Purvis Estupinian. We got Marcus Rashford. Phil Foden, Martinelli, Kyle Saka with the vice captaincy, uh, Mitomo, Jao Pedro, and Erling Haaland with the captaincy, Solanke, Luke Shaw, and Joachim Anderson on the bench. Now we do have one free transfer, uh, as you can see here on the transfer screen. We got 0.5 million in the bank, so we could do Solanke to Jackson if we wanted to. We could take out Solanke. Uh, and put in Nicholas Jackson uh, for the exact amount. However, we would have to probably play him over the likes of Jao Pedro or Rashford or Martinelli or someone like that because currently Solanke's position is on our bench. I do like Solanke's fixture this week. I do think he has a chance to get some attacking returns because Spurs are quite open. Um, it also looks like uh, Nicholas Jackson might be going up in price tonight. Uh, we can take a look at those uh, pretty quickly. Um, just so you, I mean, he would have already gone up in price by the time you're watching this anyway, um, if he did. But yeah, there's plenty of players supposed to be going um, going down. Most of the notable ones is potentially Jao Pedro. That won't affect his buying price if you bought him at 5.5. Um, uh, Darwin Nunez uh trent uh who else here of any note maybe ben rama apart from that not really too much going on there in terms of players going up nicholas jackson Vissa with romero gusto edison the stupid and saka all fairly close as well so just want to keep an eye on it would have potentially they would they would have already gone up or down um the night before anyway so um so yeah. Hey Mono, how's it going? Look at your rank while well, nice. It's very early and it's also very much inflated because of the bench boost. For those who don't know, uh, I'm and I'm watching the stream for the first time, um, or uh, didn't watch the first uh, uh, first game week. I did bench boost in game week one. Um, we had Pickford instead of Turner. Turner's the only player from the original team that's different. Um, we bench boosted. It got itself 29 points. Johnston got nine points. Anderson got nine points. Johnston got six. 
um, Chilwell uh, got seven, who was on our bench, um, and Solanke got seven as well. So we did quite well uh, on that front. Uh, 29? Well, yeah, 29. Uh, six plus nine is 15, plus 14 is 29. Yep, got the math right there. Um, did I knock something there? What did I knock? I knocked something. Oh, that's what I knocked. I have a little, uh, a little, uh, like, uh, bowl that I basically roll underneath my foot to help me uh, help my arches I'm fairly flat footed so it definitely helps and stops me from getting like uh, shin splints and, and that sort of stuff would recommend to be honest a tennis ball works just as fine as well but I happen to have this weird glow in the dark sphere thing I think it came with like some magic kit or something um, which is interesting um, anyway back to FPL um so yeah, there's going to be a lot of managers going to be bringing in Foden this week. A lot of managers going to be bringing in Jackson. A lot of managers going to be in Malagusto. Um, a lot of managers getting rid of Bruno Fernandez, getting rid of Rashford. Um, well, there's been some been some potential updates that would potentially change that. So let's go through some of the key injuries uh, that have happened uh, this week. So the first one uh, that actually broke uh, probably maybe an hour ago or so uh, is actually, funny enough, Luke Shaw. So Luke Shaw uh, by David Ornstein, uh, he broke the news saying Luke Shaw has a muscle I issue. And we're not sure what type of muscle issue, whether it's um, hamstring or thigh or calf or whatever it may be. But Luke Shaw is going to be out for uh, several weeks. Um, it's more, he said, more like weeks than months. So to me, that would mean less than nine weeks, but could be up to nine weeks, which is quite a long time. Now, what does that do in terms of defensively for Manchester United? Well, it certainly makes them worse, uh, for sure. In terms of defenders that Man United currently have uh, in their ranks FPL-wise, um, Malasia is currently injured, and we don't know when he's going to return. Uh, Ted and Mengi is a centre-back, quite ex inexperienced. Harry Maguire is like fifth-choice centre-back, basically. Uh, so he's not going to play left back. They have we have Alvaro Fernandez who can play left back as a four million defender. Uh, Eric Bailly I think is on his way out the door as well. Um, Brandon Williams just went on loan to uh, Ipswich, so he's not going to play. Uh, Lindelof is not going to play uh, left back at all. Delo can play at left back. Four point nine million is possible. Um, Wan Bissaka could play there, but is also probably going to play right back because Delo, Delo, um, Wan Bissaka. And Alvaro Fernandez are the only three fit fullbacks we have available. As Mono says in the chat, uh, also Martinez potentially left back as well. That to me would be then spreading our 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 center backs thin, which is not what we need. Um, I I personally think you're just going to see Diego Delo play left back, um, and he's just going to invert from the left hand side, which is perfectly fine for him to be honest. Um, he's just good. The fullback was going to invert anyway. So that makes the most sense to me, uh, is to see Delo just kind of slot in there um, and play that role. So Luke Shaw being out is is a definite sell for next week. I had planned on selling either him or Saliba. This now makes my decision much easier, uh, personally. Um, United's fixtures over the next four aren't great. Um, the best fixture is probably... Palace at home, Burnley away, but those are two fixtures away, plus there's an international break in between. Shaw, if he's lucky, might be back uh, for like the Palace or Brentford game, uh, but likelihood is he's probably going to be out until after the second international break, if it is as long as they are suspecting it could be. Um, so that is a big blow for Manchester United. Manchester United also have several players currently injured at the moment, uh, which is not great for them. Most of them were fringe players, but the likes of Kobe Menu could have been a very influential. Ahmed Diallo uh, could have been very influential. So that is an issue for United at the moment. Another injury that is also cropped up that is quite key um, is actually uh, in CISO. Uh, and it turns out uh, there was reports today, not sure how true they were, um, but the Paraguay, uh, the Paraguay national team posted um, a notice about uh, Julio and CISO. Um, but it looks like he could be out for four months, basically. It looked like it could be several months, uh, which would 
considering he's mostly direct competition for Jao Pedro for that number 10 spot. Especially if Brighton don't sign a right back and put Gross in the number 10. Um, because it seems like James Milner and Pascal Gross are going to play the right back slash other midfielder role. It looks like Jao Pedro has a free shot basically at the number 10 role. I think Buenanate is more of a right-sided player. So if we go through all the players that could play there. Welbeck could play the 10, but is traditionally, traditionally played as a 9 or alongside Evan Ferguson and vice versa. Uh, Zakiri, as far as I know, is not getting a look in at all. Uh, Hinshelwood, I've not seen him play at all. Jakob Motor is more of like a, a box-to-box midfielder from what I've seen. Could he play that role? Possibly. Alzate, again... Very similar to Motor, I think, in that sense. Lalana could play there. Could take minutes off of Jao Pedro. 4.9 million. James Milner is going to be more defensive-minded. Pascal Gross, like we said, could play there uh, if Brighton were to sign another right back. Uh, Gilmore uh, and Dahoud are going to be more uh, defensive-minded midfielders. Uh, Adingra could play there. He looks very good in the, in the Luton fixture. Uh, in game week one, I uh, didn't see the pitch uh, in game week two. I think he could potentially play that more advanced role as well. Um, so he may be an issue for him. Uh, and then Matoma and March, we know what we're going to get out of them. They're going to play on the left and right, respectively. So I think Jao Pedro pretty much has a free run uh, at that position uh, currently. In terms of right backs, I mean, the only real one that is, you know, is Tarek Lamptey, but he seems to be being really slowed down in terms of his, like, what he can and can't do um, when he can and can't play because he is quite injury prone. So that is something that Brighton now have to deal with. What does this mean for people who have sold Joe Pedro? If you sold Joe Pedro for Nicholas Jackson, that's a perfectly fine decision. I think that's fine. If you look at the fixtures, Joe Pedro has a very good fixture at home uh, versus West Ham in game week three, which is this week, uh, and then has a very mixed uh, amount of good and very bad fixtures uh, for the next five weeks or so. Luckily, if you still kept on to Joe Pedro, he is someone who you can kind of just stick on your bench. Uh, if you wanted to, uh, if you need him as a first reliable sub, I think the Bournemouth at home fixture is okay. Um, I think the Liverpool at home fixture is actually okay from an offensive standpoint, uh, an attacking standpoint. Uh, and then you have a really good set of fixtures from 11 um, until basically uh, Boxing Day, really, uh, minus probably the Arsenal game. Would you do Jao Pedro to Jackson as a second free transfer this week? I mean, if you want to go for it, you can. Um, like I said, I would say Jackson's probably going to be the most popular replacement. Um, Jackson, his ownership uh, at the moment is 18% and it is climbing. Um, I think he's probably going to go up in price uh, if he hasn't done so already by the time you're watching this VOD. Um, he, he would have probably gone up in price to 7.1. If he hasn't, uh, then I would definitely be looking to get him as well. Um, so yeah, I think that's perfectly reasonable. I just think Brighton have been so good that I want to give Jao Pedro this fixture. I had intended him to do so, uh, because if we go on to FPL.team, uh, and we look at, uh, game week, uh, four's fixture. So I currently have one free transfer. I used to transfer in game week two. That was to get rid of Pickford, uh, for Matt Turner. Um, so in game week four, I put in, uh, Johnston, um, they play Newcastle, which is a tough fixture. Um, so Saliba versus Man United at home. I think both teams are probably going to score in that one. Um, although it's looking like Arsenal could do quite well. Uh, this might be a situation where it's time to get rid of Shaw for uh, Gusto. Just because he's a cheap starting uh, 4.0 defender. Put him in over Saliba. Put Saliba on the bench. Uh, get rid of Solanke. Uh, bring in Jackson because we'll have plenty of money to do so. Um, and then put him in. Play the Arsenal Man United midfielders. Um... And then go from there. Uh, to be honest, that is probably what I would um, what I would do uh, for next week. It just makes the most sense to me. To me personally, it also gives an opportunity to see what Jackson is like in a home game versus a team that's not very good. Uh, remember his first two fixtures: West Ham away is much trickier than West Ham at home, uh, and then Liverpool is always going to be somewhat difficult. Did have chances in those games. He is getting involved, and we can take a look at that uh, in a bit because we're going to look at some Chelsea heat maps and statistics. 
Um, so that is kind of what I'm looking to do. I don't want to do it this week because I do think with Enciso's injury, the most likely replacement to go in there is going to be Jao Pedro. Um, even if Jao Pedro is on the bench and doesn't play or whatever, I have Solanke coming in uh, versus Spurs at home, who I think is potentially a good uh, replacement. But it's, I don't really, I don't need to make a transfer. I don't have the likes of, you know, Gabriel and Stones and Reese James all injured or something like that. I don't have the defensive woes that some people have. Yes, Luke Shaw being injured is, isn't great. But the second Chelsea finish on um, on on Friday, um, I could potentially just make those two two transfers uh, right off the bat because we do have the, we do have bench coverage. Uh, you know, Yaki Anderson is a player that's going to play. Joe Pedro will come off the bench, even though it is if if he doesn't play to start versus Newcastle, he will still he will still probably play. Um, Malagusto is seemingly going to play. Uh, again, if these injuries crop up, they crop up. But we can go early on the, on the on the prices, um, and we can also kind of slow roll it too. If it looks like Malagusto is going to go up and Jackson um, is going to go up, then we can move them in. For all we know, Jackson could, you know, ha n not do very well um, in the game uh, tomorrow, and it looks like his price might go down. Because I suspect that if Jackson doesn't, it doesn't go up in price tonight, and then he blanks tomorrow or gets another like one pointer, so he gets booked and, and whatever, people are gonna rage sell him. To be honest, um, so that's one thing I can kind of, I kind of want to hope that he doesn't go up tonight, um, and then and hopefully um, we can gauge him tomorrow uh, with a bit of a clean slate. So that's one thing that I'm looking to looking to to look at. Um, in, in tomorrow's game, especially. So those are two key injuries, um, which have occurred uh, this week, or at least cropped up this week. Another injury, which is not an injury, but uh, potentially a comeback, is two players, actually. One is uh, Alexander um, Zinchenko. Now, Zinchenko... Uh, came on uh, as a substitute versus Crystal Palace. Zinchenko is apparently quite critical into having Gabriel play. Uh, and that is because they want, uh, or at least Arteta wants, a left-footed uh, defender to play on the back three. So what do I mean by that? So if you look at the pitch here, I got my mouse here. If there's a back three, it'll be, um, it'll be let's say, Ben White, <clears throat> who would be like the right back. Saliba would be the center back, even though he's the left-sided center back. Uh, Stupinian, who would be Gabriel, is the left-sided center back, will be playing left back in a three. And then Zachenko will come into these central spaces alongside the likes of Declan Rice. Um, and then you can have um, Havertz, and, Havertz and Odegaard just ahead of them. And then you can have your front three. Um, so you can basically do like a three box three, which is what City do as well. And I think it's super important because they want a left footed inverting on the left hand side, uh, which makes angle of passes much easier um, for that mirrored kind of shape. Um, and it also um, they have the coverage with Rice there uh, to do the work to cover for Zinchenko going infield. And then Gabriel is much better um, when he has a touch line to help him uh, and, and defend uh defend kind of for him uh, but also being left footed on the left side is also an advantageous as well in terms of passing lanes and playing out from the back would you give the mid united uh rash and bruno one more chance this week of course it's forced at home like you have you kind of have to i think <clears throat> i think you kind of have to um like there are people a lot of a lot of a lot of a lot of people a lot of managers going for phil foden this week i've seen people get rid of uh, Bruno for Phil Foden. I've seen people get Rashford for Phil Foden. Um, I'm seeing people get rid of Joe Pedro for for Jackson, and easily Pedro could put up uh, could get a penalty, get max bonus points. Foden could not even start. Um, you know Bernardo Silva's back. He could go straight back in the team. Foden on the bench, and Bruno could get a penalty and get max bonus too. Like it's 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 it. I think this week could be very 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 kind of. Uh, hit or miss depending on who you have because there's a lot of really good fixtures and i expect the uh a lot of the good players to do well basically this week which could be basically all of them and it's just a matter on how well they do and what mix of players you do have
another key uh, player that we saw that was back in training was Gabriel Jesus. Uh, Gabriel Jesus is quite important. Um, he is someone who helps Martinelli be better. Um, he was back in training. I don't expect him to be on the bench, potentially. If he is on the bench, um, I, I would expect that Arteta is going to try not to use him if he doesn't have to. And see if he can get Gabriel Jesus fit and ready for uh, when they play um, Manchester United in game week four. Uh, that's the last game before the international break, actually. Um, so that would be something I would think that Arteta would try to do. See if he can get some minutes in, if he can, uh, in a very chilled environment. I'm not sure how long Jesus is. Obviously, had a very serious injury last season, uh, which kept him out for several months. Uh, so they don't want to rush him back and then have him out for several months again, because that would not be ideal for him. Um, so yeah, after the United game, there's an international break. Um... And then there's uh, four games, then another international break. Um, uh, and then there's uh, and then there's another four. Get there's three international breaks, which is crazy still. I don't know why there's still so many, uh, but there is. Um, so yeah, that's on the injury front. That's kind of the crucial, kind of some crucial details um, there that we know of for all the teams relevant in FPL. Uh, one thing we're going to take a look at now, so this is Fantasy Football Scouts members area. We'll give a shout out to them at the very end, uh, as we normally do. Uh, check the link in the description or in the about section uh, if you're over here on Twitch. We have it in, in all of our videos uh, in the description. Um, this is the Fantasy Football Scout members area. This is a heat map comparing Gusto uh, on the left hand side here and Ben Chilwell on the right hand side. The closer these like kind of red spots are to the bottom of the pitch, is the um the that's the attack the end that they're attacking. So this would be the opposition's goal. As you can see, Ben Chilwell is basically playing cat a corner to the opposition's 18-yard box. Malagusto is probably a bit more centrally, getting a lot of his touches potentially in his own half, but does still make his way um in a more advanced area and can potentially whip crosses from deep as well so why is this important well this is important because malagosto is four million um and is playing as a traditional right back now if we were to go to um there is an average position on here So Malagosta's average position is basically around the halfway line. If we change it to to, to Ben Chilwell's average position, he's you could clearly tell he's much more advanced. Uh, he's receiving much more touches uh, towards the uh, uh, basically the opposition's 18-yard box. He's like getting really close to him. He is basically playing left-sided um, left-sided attacker in a 4-2-3-1, whereas Malagosta is playing right back. In a um, in a four two three one, on paper it looks like it's a, a three four three of some kind, or like a three five two of some kind. Uh, but if like if I wanted to compare, um, let me change this to uh, Sterling, so we can get some context. If you look at Raheem Sterling's touch map. It's pretty mirrored to Ben Chilwell's if we're looking at it. If we go to the average position by game week, average position by game week, you can see that basically Raheem Sterling, he's a bit bit narrower, a uh, bit narrower, uh, because Gusto plays a bit more in this sort of position here. Um, whereas uh, Chilwell, uh, probably uh, whoever like the left midfielder is, would probably be a bit more reserved. But you can see basically Chilwell on the right, Sterling on the left, Obviously, on the screen, not on the actual positions on the field. Sterling plays right wing. Chilwell is basically playing left wing. Um, Chilwell is basically playing his left wing. That's why he is so good at his value. Because he's getting the clean sheet points. But he's also basically just literally getting into the box all the time. So Malagosto is 1.6 million currently less. Is he going to be worth it? I think so. Um, in terms of... If we were to change this back to... Uh, Malagusto 
and we check the number of uh oh of chill was 5.7 sorry um in terms of his xgi he's not very involved um whereas chill obviously quite is However, the total number of touches that Malagusto gets uh, is much higher than Ben Chilwell's. Uh, he gets the same amount of touches in the opposition half. It's just Ben Chilwell gets a lot more in the final third. So Malagusto could be more of an assist potential, uh, whereas Ben Chilwell looks to be more of a goal threat. Very similar to kind of the Reese James Chilwell dynamic uh, as well. So I think Malagusto as a player is very, very good for his value. Um, if we take a look at Jackson now, let's take a look at Jackson. Jackson. Nicholas Jackson. So if we look at the touch map, Nicholas Jackson getting a lot of touches centrally. Uh, that's what you kind of want to see. Um, his inspected goal involvement is fairly high, which you would expect. Um, his total number of touches is a similar amount to Ben Chilwell's, uh, but he gets way less touches in the final third as would make more sense because he's trying to get in the box, basically. And we'll have less touches, especially if he's on the break. Um, but overall, I think Jackson is still a good pick. Um, if we wanted to compare Jackson now, because we can see... Actually, let's check the average position again. So average position per game week he is very central. Um, average position per game week. I mean, Ben Chilwell is getting further up. And that's mainly because the ball kind of gets cycled out to the right-hand side. And then Chilwell goes in towards the back post, as he often does in this, like, darting diagonal run here. That's very good for FPL. Jackson does like to drop off the line and get involved, get a lot of touches on the ball. Make sure he's never out of the game, which is good from Chelsea from a footballing standpoint. But in terms of FPL standpoint, he might be doing a little bit more work than he maybe needs to. If we want to compare Jackson to... Uh, Jao Pedro. Let's see. So if we did all matches, just because Jao Pedro came off the bench last game. If we look at all matches, we see that um, quite often Jackson is in the middle, but also does interchange uh, and go out to the left-hand side. Jao Pedro plays the number 10 role, but he plays more of like a left-sided number 10. Because if I were to take this and change this from um, uh, Jackson to... Who would it be? Would it be Dahoud? Possibly. Or it'd be Danny Welbeck, maybe. Let's change this to Welbeck and see. I just want to see in comparison. So Jao Pedro's a bit bit wider coming in from that left-hand side-ish, which also means cutbacks towards him look to be quite good. Danny Welbeck, again, kind of overloading that left-hand side. That's interesting to see. Um, where would Dahoud be collecting the ball? Dahoud much deeper, much more central. What about Sully March? Is he much wider? Uh, Sully March is much wider. So who's taking... I'm curious to know. Who's taking up this position here? Uh, in midfield. Because there's a lot of... There seems to be a lot of left-hand bias... Um, with that, maybe it's what would Pascal Gross be looking like. Pascal Gross. Yeah, see, even he's a bit deeper. That's a bit weird. How they kind of just have this void in this right half space where there's kind of nobody there. I guess it's maybe for Sully March to run into, and then you just have everyone flood the left hand side, and then it's just kind of bolts play to the back post. Uh, area or people run from the back to the penalty spot like how you can see with Jao Pedro on this spot here um, very interesting to see um, in terms of uh, XGI um, or XG non-penalty uh, Jao Pedro um, uh, where is it? XG from open place still 0.72 uh, 
Uh, obviously, he did have the, the penalty which he took, um, which will boost him up quite a bit. In terms of touches total, um, 80 total touches, 44 in the final third. Still quite good. Um, you know, he is receiving the ball in decent enough areas, and his goal involvement seems to be, uh, you know, quite good. I mean, he could have definitely got more in the first game uh, versus Luton. So I expect Jal Pedro to do quite well. Uh, I'm going to hang on to him at least for this game. Uh, be just because it makes the most uh, the most sense to do so, uh, personally. Um, so, that's how I kind of see it. Could you replace him with Jackson? Yeah, there's a reason to do so. I mean, Luton at home is a much better fixture, I think, on paper. Than, um, than West Ham at home. That just makes kind of the most sense to me. Um, but overall, I think for his price... Especially with the CISO out. Team that's going to kind of sit back and park the bus. I mean, Luton kind of did that. Wolves definitely did that. And Brighton tore them both to shreds. So I can only expect what Brighton's going to do. Maybe West Ham are going to super frustrate them. We'll see. Edson Alvarez might have a part to play in that. But uh, I'm back in Brighton this week to do some damage. Um... So let's go over to the transfer plan. So this is um, FPL.team. A fantastic website. That you should all be using. So this is how my team currently is set up for Game Week 3 as represented in the, um, in the actual Fantasy Premier League game. So, no immediate transfers needed to be made this week. Could I have a luxury move of going Jao Pedro uh, to Nicholas Jackson? Possibly. But Jao Pedro, like I said, could easily get a penalty. Jackson could just have a day where he just doesn't really, you know, get involved. Or maybe plays the hockey assist, dropping off the line. And Sterling's the one that gets involved. Um, whoever it might be. Also, with uh, Chukwameka out. And apparently, Mudrick has an injury now. Who are they going to play on that left-hand side? We'll have to wait and see. So maybe that's kind of a watch and wait. And maybe somebody else crops up that we could go instead of Jackson if we want to. Maybe Sterling is the one to go for. We'll have to wait and see. So this is the team as it currently stands. Uh, Johnston would be in goal. So no, again, like I said, no immediate transfer. What I would do this week, well, Luke Shaw is injured. And nor would I want to play him in the upcoming fixtures for United until maybe game week six onwards. Uh, but he's going to be out for probably the majority of those fixtures. So he's going to go. Gusto will likely be the one again forced at home. Seems to be like a good fixture. We can bench Saliba. We can then get rid of Dominic Solanke. Uh, for Jackson. Or whichever forward up to 8.5 million we would like to bring in. Jao Pedro would drop to the bench. And this is what we would run with. We would run with Rashford, Saka, and Martinelli all against each other. Holland and Foden versus Fulham. Uh, Matoma and Stupinian versus Newcastle. Johnson versus Wolves, and then all the Chelsea boys uh, versus Nottingham Forest. There is a temptation to play Joachim Anderson over Estupinian just because of a slightly better fixture, but Estupinian, as we saw, 4-1 win, gets a golden assist. Game week five after the international break, uh, it is possible we could wildcard here if we wanted to. Um, having only one free transfer wouldn't be great. Um but would be something that I could possibly utilize. Um, Mitoma, Stupinian playing United. Um, again, not the greatest. Um, Rashford playing against them. Saka, Martinelli, uh, Saliba all the way to Everton. We're definitely going to want to play the Chelsea boys here uh, versus Bournemouth and Foden and Holland. I mean, Holland scored two on his opening debut versus West Ham uh, at the London Stadium. Um, I think it's called the London Stadium, West Ham Stadium. Um, and on his professional debut in the Premier League. So, Choosing Gabrielle and trying over and over at the announcement. And then the site crash is killed me. It did the same thing for me, but I managed to get it through. Um, I didn't know why. I just knew that it was something that if Andy's doing it, then it probably makes sense. Thoughts on the Watkins hat trick? Um... Again, it's a game against a team that's very weak opposition. Um, 
you know, it is a... Excuse me. Uh, it's a conference league qualifier. So again, not really too much to kind of think about. Um, I guess you can say Watkins is now technically in form. Uh, would I be selling him this week for Jackson? No, would not be doing that. Would I be selling him for Julian Alvarez, uh, who's another one that we could see uh, some involvement? No, I, I wouldn't be doing that either. Definitely keep Watkins uh, for for game week game week three, and then assess afterwards. And had Botman and Dogie f uh, first bench both weeks, and Gabriel Trotter on for cameos. Yeah, that's gonna happen. I think if you have Gabrielle this week, I think it's either a bench or a sell, uh, personally. Uh, that's how I just feel. Um, I think you just can't trust him. Uh, because the second Zinchenko gets injured, it looks like it's just going to be just gonna be chaos, basically. Minutes are definitely more important. Getting someone who starts is definitely more important. If they get carted all five minutes into the game, then you could consider yourself unlucky. I mean, I had uh, Raheem Sterling last season uh, in a double game week. Uh, he had, I think it was like Man City at home and then like somebody else at home. It was a really good double, which Chelsea, I think, I think they ended up doing decently well in that double. Um, and basically, um, Raheem Sterling went into a challenge with John Stones in the first like two minutes of the game and got basically walked off because he had a hamstring injury. Sometimes it's a super bad luck. I remember there was a few seasons ago, everyone was triple captaining Sadio Mane. Went off in like the first 20 minutes with an injury. So, things can happen like that. Leroy Sané as well, a season before that, I believe. So, it is what it is. Um, but yeah, definitely go for the minutes. Um, Saliba versus Everton. I mean, Everton can't seem to hit a barn door, so maybe... I mean, this is tough. I think both United and Brighton probably score. United seem to be better at scoring at home for sure. So benching a stupid yen would definitely be bad. I don't like it. Um, and Bomo as well. Newcastle away, so I can't really swap to swap Matoma for him if I wanted to. It would maybe just be a keep. Um... Yeah, maybe it's just keep and then restructure next week. But then, I mean, if you look at game week six, I mean. I mean, I guess I'll bench Saliba versus Tottenham at home. But again, I kind of want to play Joe Pedro. He looks pretty good. Um, am I going to get rid of Sacco Martinelli before Bournemouth away? Probably not. Um, Rashford Burnley away. Has a really good run of fixtures still by getting rid of him. Again, there's a lot of things that is quite difficult. Johnston obviously would play in game week six. I mean, have two free transfers and have no idea what to do with them. You know. So that's the unfortunate thing with hanging on to these uh these transfers. That's the thing. Some some people are having to use their transfers or chips or like a, like a wild card to fix the likes of Stones and Reese James and Luke Shaw and Gabriel and whoever. I'm in a position where I can literally roll this week, go into next week, use two, and then unless the international break causes some players to break down or something, I'm rolling again on the other side of it probably. You know, maybe, uh, you know, maybe since Chelsea's fixtures are cooling off a touch, or maybe Reese James, may, maybe he's back. I don't, I don't know. Um, maybe it's, uh, we look at, uh, we look at Trippier, maybe, because again, his fixtures in game week six are, are quite good. Game week five, he has Brentford at home, but game week six is really when they start. So you can go Saliba, uh, two Trippier, and then play him over Malagusta. Malagusta just becomes like the, you know, the one, just your four million defender. 
that is an option in game week six. Um, wouldn't have the funds to do uh, whatever forward I would want for Newcastle if I was going to get one. But again, maybe by then Wilson or Isak are injured and the other one's going to play and then you just pick the other one. That's kind of... The Isak and Wilson kind of conundrum is very similar to the Aguero-Jesus one. It's like, is Jesus injured? Okay, well you buy Aguero and vice versa. I mean, then in game week seven, I mean... the. You know, fixtures still look pretty good. Not really going to want to get rid of anyone. <laughs> Again, might be burning a transfer. Maybe I, maybe I just downgrade Anderson to Kabore just to get more funds. So to not burn a transfer. Game week 8 before the international break. Saka, Martinelli. I mean, on the, on the other side of it, they have Chelsea away. But then they have Sheffield United at home. So, what's Liverpool's fixtures look like? Liverpool have Everton at home, but I'd rather want them for the Forest and Luton. Yeah, exactly. Archer's another one. I forgot to mention him as a as like a transfer. Four point five million is going to be playing up front for Sheffield United. Possibly, he's one to kind of keep there. This is also potentially a week to go uh, away from Erling Holland. Um, with a Liverpool player, if Salah's still at Liverpool. Again, there are speculations at the time of this recording that he's potentially has a big money move going to going to Saudi Arabia as well. So we'll see on that front as well. Could be interesting. Um, Brian and Bomo, his fixtures kind of turn, but he has a good run from nine, uh, gimmicks 9, 10, 11. Um... Uh, Diaby, Guinea 6.6, .6, has a very good run. As, you know, Wolves away, West Ham at home, Luton at home. You know, maybe he comes in for Matoma because, I mean, you can always just potentially keep Matoma as well. It's going to be very tough. Maybe this where Foden goes because Man City's fixtures do kind of get a bit rough. So this might be a week to, to, to wild card. Yeah, Salah's getting offered 350k a day, apparently. Which is nuts. But, yeah, it's it's a bit of a... Bit of a crazy one. Bit of a crazy one. All things considered. Bit, bit wonky. Um, what else was I going to do? Oh, right. That was kind of another important thing. Where's the transfer screen? I don't think he's in FPL yet. Assume he's going to be a midfielder. Uh, but uh, Doku has signed for Man City as well. I'll just put Phil Foden up on the screen for now. Um, so, Doku is someone who is basically... The closest thing to like a Leroy Sané type player, uh, but except on the opposite side. Now, why is this effect Phil Foden? Well, Phil Foden can play on the right-hand side, but so can Bernardo Silva. So there's a lot of coverage there now in terms of who can play there. Uh, Cole Palmer can obviously play there as well. So now you have Phil Foden, Cole Palmer, Doku, and, um, and Bernardo Silva who can play there. Doku's going to be a bit more explosive, a bit more of the pace, uh, whereas Bernardo Silva would be a bit more control, Phil Foden with a bit more of the skill and the like, kind of uh, creativity in there. Um, so that could definitely take away from Foden. However, I think if De Bruyne is out um, and Bernardo's playing on the right... Then I just kind of don't see a world where not playing Phil Foden in one of those two high advanced eight roles um, isn't just basically the only option really. Um, because basically you're going to have a situation where, well, who's going to play every game? Well, if assuming everyone's fit, Ederson's going to play every game because he's goalkeeper. Makes sense. Um, 
Would Eze not be better versus Foden as he has the minutes uh, and no Europe? I mean, yeah, but Eze's fixtures off the start wasn't great. I've, I've had Foden from the start, so he's done. He's got, what, 12 points in, in two games, so average six points. Not bad. Also, he's gone up in price, too, which kind of helps. Um, but, yeah, so you have Ederson, one. Uh, Diaz, definitely going to play. Um, Vardiol is definitely going to play. John Stones will definitely play. Um, and then one of Kyle Walker, Akanji, um, one of Kyle Walker, Akanji, or Ake will play depending on opposition and who they want to shut down. So like they're playing against Mo Salah. The likelihood is, is that, um, Ake will play as the left-sided center back with, uh, Vardy always like kind of the middle center back and Diaz on the right. Uh, and then they'll have. Uh, Stones kind of funnel into midfield. If they need to shut down like Vinicius Jr. or Mbappe on the left-hand side, they'll put Walker in on that side. They can do a bunch of different things uh, with the defenders. But those spots... Excuse me. Are basically locked off. Um, in terms of just filled spots. Rodri, if he's fit, he's going to play every game. So Rodri's in there. So that's five spots remaining. So the five spots remaining is basically the two wide players, left wing and right wing. Um, the central striker, which is going to be Holland. So basically there's now four spots. Uh, so you have the two attacking eights, left and right. The two wide players, left and right. Now where can Foden play? Well, Foden can play on the left-hand side. He can play on the right-hand side. He can play left eight. He can play right eight. He can play all four of those positions. Pep tends to not use him in very important games in one of those two eight positions. Fine, that's Pep's prerogative. I thought Phil Foden was great at popping into um, various different uh, kind of spaces in between the lines. He was constantly basically having his hand down saying, give me the ball. And the one time they did give it to him, they scored immediately from it, basically. And he was doing it quite often. Haaland had many chances he could have scored um, in terms of... Um, in terms of a uh, XGI 0.86, I mean Phil Foden could have definitely had more returns for sure. I mean expected assists of 0.53 is quite high to be honest. Um, and he's played 90 minutes both games, which is quite nice. Um, and I think he should continue to play 90 minutes. So left side at eight looks to potentially be Mateo Kovacic. Or in some games, he plays alongside Roger, which means it's more of a number 10, and then two wide players. Fine. So if Kovacic plays, um, then the number 10 slash right side at 8 has to be more of a creative player. That can be Julian. It can be, well, it can be a front two. It can be Julian Alvarez in there. It can be Phil Foden in there. It can also be Kevin De Bruyne in there. Now, Kevin De Bruyne is currently injured, so that limits it a little bit. Klopp, uh, not Klopp, uh, uh, Guardiola has been playing um, Julian Alvarez kind of in that space. Um, him and Foden are like kind of interchanging in that position from the right side to the right uh, attacking eight. Um, and then the left-hand side seems to be somewhat isolated on their kind of own. It's kind of where Jack Grealish kind of operates and kind of does his work. I think Phil Foden's worst position from an FPL point of view is uh, the left of the front three, basically. I think his best possible position is playing in that right side at eight where De Bruyne plays, where he can basically play like second striker and just constantly feed uh, Holland for the goals. Does Doku affect this? Well, Pep likes to play in somewhat important games uh he likes to play Bernardo Silva on the right-hand side um, in the front three, which means Doku won't play because Doku's basically his only position is there, um, which means if he wants more control, he likes Julian Alvarez for his pressing um, and Kovacic for his ball retention. That would mean that um, Phil Foden would be benched unless he plays on the left-hand side over Jack Grealish, in which case then we're not interested in terms of an FPL point of view. Um, unless Phil Foden goes like Super Saiyan or something. 
So arguably right now is the best possible time to have Foden because Jeremy Doku is going to get... I think it's Jeremy Doku. I could be saying his name completely wrong. I have no clue. Uh, let's see. Uh, Doku. Like Goku, but not... Oh, it is Jeremy. Okay, I got it right. And he's only 21. Crazy. Super, super young. Um... So yeah, we're Phil Foden played versus Newcastle. I hope he plays in that same position versus Sheffield United. Because getting in between the lines, Sheffield United are not very organized defensively. He's going to cut them to shreds uh, and could see big scores from him uh, as well. Uh, Doku will probably um, not play. Uh, I can see Pep running the same team back, potentially. Um, if not play uh, Bernardo Silva uh, on the right-hand side. If he were to play Bernardo Silva... In the midfield, he could play Rodri uh, as the DM. Bernardo Silva is the left side at eight. Kovic is the right side at eight, which will put Phil Foden out wide right. Um, because I don't think he played Julian Alvarez in that style of system, which is still fine for Phil Foden as well. But I would like to see him a bit more centrally, although Kovic isn't one to potentially interchange in that instance. Um, so it might make Phil Foden a bit more... A bit more isolated. Maybe not as much on the, as on the left-hand side. It seems like the left-hand side is very functional. It is very designed to just create width, basically. Whereas the right-hand side, you know, seasons gone by with Riyad Mahrez as an example, can kind of float inside and can kind of get involved a bit more. Um, now, with Doku, we might see that um, he's more of just straight down the line, how Leroy Sané used to do, and then Sterling coming in at the back post. Now, if Phil Foden played on the left-hand side and Doku was playing on the right-hand side, that would be much more interesting of a prospect because that means Foden would be probably coming in more of the back post how Sterling used to do with Sané on the opposite side, but it would just be mirrored in this instance. Doku would be on the right-hand side, Phil Foden on the left-hand side, Doku going down the line on the right, Phil Foden coming in off the left. That would be of interest there. Um, so if that did happen, that'd be quite good, but then it would mean Jack Grealish would then be on the bench or he'd be playing in a more... Uh, midfield style role now with everyone fit and available personally if Pep is playing a team where they're going to sit back and he can basically carve them to bits um, I can easily see him playing a, a, a team where he's got um, Vardy Old Diaz, Stones and Walker, just Walker just for emergency pace only um, Stones playing midfield alongside Rodri um, ahead of them too would be Phil Foden on the left-hand side, De Bruyne on the right-hand side, um, in terms of like central midfield, uh, like high number eights. Jack Grealish would be on the left, Erling Haaland through the middle, and then Jeremy Doku on the right-hand side. Um, so you basically just have a bit of everything. You have some unlock potential, and you can just basically get break everything open. If you need a bit more control, um, he would play. He would remove Foden and put in. Uh, Bernardo Silva somewhere, or he would remove Doku and put in Bernardo Silva. It's kind of the options you have. Uh, but overall, I think Phil Foden's next two fixtures are very good. Man City's fixtures overall are just generally good. I mean, this run of, uh, what's it, five games here, um, you know, two home games versus Fulham and Forest. Fulham could have easily conceded a couple goals versus Everton. They didn't. They conceded three versus um, Brentford. I mean, the red card, but even still. Forest away from home haven't been great. Wolves, I mean, they got shredded by by uh, by Brighton um, at Wolves too. West Ham, Holland's already picked them apart already, and Sheffield United are arguably the most uh, most uh, uh, not under most underdeveloped. That's not even like a thing. Um, most unprepared team, I would say, for the season, possibly. They're doing a lot of signings late. Um, they don't seem very organized in the back, and everyone's tipped them basically to go down in 20th of the season. So, again, one to keep an eye out on. Um, so, yeah, this is the team as it currently stands. I don't think I'm going to make a transfer, unless some late, late team news happens. Um, for the giggles, I might just put in Luke Shaw because, you know, we know he's not going to play. Um, but, now nah, we'll leave him on the bench. Um, so Johnston would be the other thing goal. Chilwo Saliba Stupinian picks itself. Midfield five. 
excuse me. Don't know why I have the yawns tonight. Um, Holland, uh, captain, just doesn't make sense to like the only uh, fixture you're potentially not captaining him in in the next coming weeks is maybe game week eight, maybe game week eight. Everything else, it's perfectly viable to be honest. Um, and then John Pedro, as you mentioned. Um, and then next week, potentially look to get in more Chelsea assets after we've seen what potentially uh, changes on the left-hand side of Chelsea system. Is Jackson still the answer? Um, does Chelsea bring in another attacker? We'll have to wait and see. Um, so that's going to do it for this deadline-ish stream. It's probably about, uh, we've gone for about, uh, I want to say 50, 50, 55 minutes or so. Um, so there's probably about 15, 20 minutes left for the deadline. If you're watching this uh, over on YouTube, again, this is a uh, VOD that we recorded the previous evening um, for uh, the deadline stream. So before we go, let's talk about Fantasy Football Scout. So make sure to check out Fantasy Football Scout. You saw some of the stuff in the members area today with the heat maps and the average positioning and that sort of stuff. There's much more in there. So make sure to check it out. Link is in the description or in the about section over on Twitch or in my bio pinned in the comment, uh, not the pinned the comment, pinned a tweet or whatever they're called now, post um, over on X or Twitter or ElonMusk.com, whatever it's called. Um, <laughs> so make sure to go check out FantasyFootballScout.co.uk. Check out the members area. It's fantastic. Now, let's move over to the big screen. So, thank you all for watching the deadline stream. Hopefully, I answered your questions in the chat um, and any queries that you might have before the deadline. Like I said, anytime there is a Friday deadline, uh, I will always um, do the deadline stream the evening before, unless I'm like have a vacation or something like that. Um, and I'll put it as a VOD. Uh, over um, on uh, on YouTube um, f b before the deadline so that you can get any questions you want and I'll make sure to answer them uh, in the chat. So thank you all for watching. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. Pilot Flame 226 on all platforms. And until the next one, take care.